Hi, everybody. I'm Tammy Murphy. I'm the Advocacy Director with Physicians for Social Responsibility. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, okay, so it's about six after, so we're going to get started now. All righty. Um, so um, there was a report by PSR National um, put together by Andy Krasner um, and Barb Gottlieb in June of 2022. So that is what this presentation is based on. And uh, it's called Hydrogen Blending in Buildings, Bad for Health and Bad for Climate. Um, so there are key takeaways <clears throat> are um, some basic information about hydrogen is what we're going to go over. And um, Hydrogen blending is a sort of new spin on hydrogen that if you haven't heard of it before, um, I suspect that you will soon. And um, the point is that most hydrogen is um, coming from what I consider dirty hydrogen. So it's increasing the greenhouse gas emissions um, by relying on fossil fuels. And the point is that other options exist for us <clears throat> so we can get right into it. Okay, so we're gonna learn a little bit more about hydrogen, um, which you, most of you probably recall as the simplest element and the most abundant element in the universe. Our focus is on using hydrogen as an energy source and how that use impacts our climate. So as I said, if you haven't uh, heard about hydrogen as an energy source, you probably will um, because there's quite a bit of hype about it. It's being pushed by the utility companies and the US government, and it's hyped up as the fuel of the future. Just like fracking was sold to us um, as a bridge fuel, they are trying to sell hydrogen as an energy source that will free us finally of fossil fuels. Truth is 99% of the time, that's not the case. Hydrogen is getting a lot of funding under the Inflation Reduction Act. <clears throat> it's considered a clean hydrogen. Um, clean hydrogen plants in 2023 can receive a substantial production tax credits up to um, $3 per kilogram of hydrogen for the first 10 years of operation. Um, the Department of Energy is offering states $8 billion. Yes, I said billion with a B to construct so-called hydrogen hubs, which are intended to be the first step toward the creation of a national network of hydrogen producers that could facilitate the emergence of a hydrogen economy. So whether we like it or not, hydrogen may also be coming to your kitchen. And why that should make you a little bit nervous and skeptical, um, it certainly makes me a bit uh, skeptical and worried. So although hydrogen is the most common element in the universe um, on earth, it actually doesn't exist, or I should say it, it rarely exists in its pure form. To be able to use hydrogen, we have to split molecules where hydrogen has bonded with other elements. Some of these are common and familiar substances. Most people are familiar with H2O since we rely on it and uh, water is life. Um, hydrogen peroxide is something that we often hear about. So we hear the word hydrogen, but we don't really um, often find it by itself. Another source of hydrogen is methane, um, also known as fracked gas, um, or sometimes referred to as natural gas, um, which <clears throat> as you probably know, is a fossil, fossil fuel and a major accelerator of climate change. Although most of the hydrogen in use today is derived from methane or other fossil fuels. Um, it also serves to perpetuate fossil fuel dependency. It's not a pathway to cooler, safer, stabilized climate. So <clears throat> although hydrogen, all the hydrogen in the US um, that's used for as an energy source, 99% um, of it, not all, 99% of it is derived from fossil fuels. And it mostly comes from methane, but also coal. And if you remember only one fact from this presentation, this is what I want you to remember when you're hearing about hydrogen as an energy source, despite what they say, despite calling it clean, um, despite the way it's sold to us, the truth is that 99% of it is produced with fossil fuels. 
So whether it's produced from gas or coal, the use of hydrogen means increasing, not decreasing, the demand for these fossil fuels and the destructive methods by which they are extracted, be that mining or fracking. So we're gonna get a bit more specific. To specify the source of hydrogen being used, hydrogen is referred to by colors. The colors don't have any real meaning. They are just labels. And the hydrogen is all the same. What we're talking about here is how it's produced. Three common types of hydrogen, brown, gray, and blue, are derived from fossil fuels. Brown hydrogen is produced from coal, Gray hydrogen is produced from methane gas, also known as natural gas or fracked gas. Blue hydrogen is produced from natural gas, fracked gas, methane, um, just like gray, <clears throat> and to which carbon, carbon capture and storage technology is added. Green hydrogen is actually produced by using renewable energy uh, to break down water. It doesn't create greenhouse gases, so it sounds great, but it isn't, there isn't enough renewable energy currently available to make a real difference. Green energy accounts for only 1% of the hydrogen available in the US. I'll talk about each one of these in a bit more depth. So brown hydrogen is produced from coal using processes such as gas, coal gasification, where carbonous materials are heated into a gas. This extraction process produces large quantities of carbon emissions that are released into the atmosphere. Every ton of brown hydrogen produced emits 10 to 12 tons of carbon dioxide, intensifying greenhouse gas levels and contributing to climate change. PSR <clears throat> PA finds brown hydrogen unacceptable for health, for the climate, for the environment, and in any use. Slide nine, we have hydrogen made from methane, which is referred to as gray hydrogen. And this is the process that you see. You can see methane leaks coming out. Um, these would be pipelines coming in and lots of carbon dioxide coming out. So-called blue hydrogen is the industry's new darling. It's gray hydrogen, the dirty one we saw on the previous slide, with an addition of carbon capture and sequestration, otherwise called CCS. <clears throat> CCS is a technology that is used in various heavy industries, steam methane reforming, coal burning power plants, cement and chemical plants, to capture the carbon dioxide that is released before it disperses into the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide, once captured, is super compressed into a liquid, piped into an underground storage facility and kept there, supposedly forever. This reminds me of the tale of the, emperor of new the emperor's new clothes. Don't be fooled. In practice, CCS technologies only capture about 50 to 65% of the carbon dioxide being generated. That means that at least a third of the carbon dioxide being generated is not actually captured. Instead, it goes into the atmosphere and contributes to endangering our climate. It requires extensive transport by pipeline. Every industrial facility that uses CCS needs to ship its carbon dioxide somewhere. How much would be needed? A recent Department of Energy report said that 30,000 to, 30, to 96,000 miles of pipeline could be required to meet net zero goals by 250 versus the 5,000 miles of carbon dioxide pipelines operating today. That's a huge, huge expansion. And this hugely extensive construction of new pipelines would lead to problems similar to other pipelines, as we've seen, damage to farmland, forest and habitat fragmentation, stream and other waterways, crossing erosion and siltation, sinkholes, and more. If new pipeline construction was not bad enough, as if new pipeline construction was not bad enough news, in an incident over four, um, in 2020, 
over 40 people received hospitalization and over 300 people were evacuated after a CO2 pipeline ruptured in Satarsha, Mississippi. Um, we can talk more about that um, perhaps in the question and answer session. Um, that is a whole presentation in itself. <clears throat> and the same could be said about the PHMSA pipeline regulations guiding the transportation of liquefied gas as if it was just a liquid, when in reality, the gas returns to an expansive state upon any rupture in the pipelines. Green hydrogen is a zero carbon emission fuel that's made by breaking down water using 100% renewable energy. This would be a great solution for our energy woes if only there was enough green hydrogen. And unfortunately, there's not. Only 1% of the hydrogen produced in the US is green hydrogen. This is a negligible amount and it's not likely to grow substantially in the near term, primarily because very large amounts of renewable energy are needed to make large quantities of green hydrogen. To give you an example, a recent study estimated that producing enough green hydrogen to provide 20% of current gas demand would use all of the state's wind energy projected through 2030, leaving exactly none for providing clean electricity to homes. Now and in the foreseeable future, the scarcity greatly limits the availability of green hydrogen. In states experiencing ongoing drought, there also may not be enough water. Electrolysis requires vast water supplies. In Arizona, California, and other states, production of green hydrogen might have to compete with water needs, such as crop irrigation and human drinking water. That's where hydrogen comes from and why we say most of it is a fossil fuel derived energy source. Now we're seeing proposals, largely from utility companies, to mix hydrogen and methane and pipe the mixture into our homes where we would burn this mixture in our gas burning furnaces, stoves, and other appliances. This is a problem for a number of reasons. Most obviously, it increases the demand for methane, both as a source from which hydrogen is made and because the mixtures will likely be predominantly methane. The mix can't go beyond 20% hydrogen by volume. So we'll still be burning 80% methane. This locks us into a continued dependence on methane, endangering both the climate and the environment. Hydrogen blending also presents its own climate, health, and safety issues. Let's start with climate. As stated previously, the use of blue or gray hydrogen made from methane or coal creates high levels of carbon emissions and climate impacts. Blending the hydrogen with methane increases greenhouse gas emissions and exacerbates climate change. As we are experiencing locally and globally, the negative health consequences of extreme weather, wildfires, floods, and heat waves affect our respiratory systems and cardiovascular systems. They increase the presence of disease carrying insects, such as ticks and other vectors, disrupts food supply and contributes to the displacement and conflict of humans. These changes in our climate negatively impact our health and safety. So is hydrogen blending with green hydrogen a solution? Even if we were to blend 20% of green hydrogen by volume, it would only reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 6%. This disappointing outcome is because hydrogen blending doesn't reduce carbon dioxide in linear fashion. Here's why. When considered by volume, what is called the volumetric energy density of methane is much greater than that of hydrogen. It exceeds the energy density of hydrogen by a factor of 3.2. In other words, hydrogen gas takes up more space but doesn't deliver as much heat energy per unit of volume. So you end up having to burn more methane and thus produce more greenhouse gas emissions. The scarce amount of green hydrogen that we have should be saved for uses where other sources like electrification can't apply. When we add blended hydrogen to gas stoves, we exacerbate pollution indoors and out.
Blending hydrogen with methane also presents safety hazards. Hydrogen ignites more easily than methane. It ignites at almost an air to fuel ratio, so leaks are dangerous. There should be no sparks around hydrogen. Electronics, for example, must be made spark free. Risk of explosion increases. In the United Kingdom, a risk assessment study predicted that the number of explosions per year and the risk of injuries from in-home explosions would be four times higher with a 20% blend of hydrogen compared to methane alone. The safety risks of blending hydrogen with methane in buildings in the United States remains unknown. Methane already leaks from appliances when they are in use and when they're turned off. If hydrogen is blended with that methane, it would of course make these leaks more dangerous. The US National Renewable Energy Laboratory noted that gas leakage from seals at joints in service lines in confined spaces may also increase the safety risk and noted this topic warrants additional risk assessment. So considering the health disparities, we always need to look at energy choices in terms of their effects on our most vulnerable populations. In the case of hydrogen produ production and hydrogen blending, we see that these choices are likely to put already vulnerable populations further in harm's way. Hydrogen blending means continued reliance on methane, which creates local pollution from fracking for oil and gas. Black communities, indigenous communities, Latino communities, and other communities of color, rural communities, and low-income communities already suffer disproportionately from fracking-related harms. Meanwhile, the production of hydrogen from methane is itself a toxic industrial process that is more likely going to increase pollution within our environmental justice communities. Indoor air pollution from methane combustion and hydrogen combustion is likely to affect communities of color and low income communities as they're likely to be exposed by higher concentrations of indoor pollution due to living in smaller spaces where the concentration of air pollution can reach dangerous levels. They're more likely to rent homes and rental units have older and inadequately vented stoves. Statistics show that too often, communities of color and low-income communities are already exposed to more nitrogen oxides and other ambient air pollution from burning fossil fuels than white people and wealthier communities. Communities of color are more likely to suffer from air pollution-related illnesses like asthma. This is especially true of Black children who suffer asthma at epidemic rates. Low-income households may not have health insurance or access to quality care. Finally, existing health inequalities are magnified by climate change. By accelerating climate change, methane and hydrogen contribute again to health inequities. We have the technology we need to decarbonize our home. Sorry. Sorry, I'm messing up the slide there. Hold on. All right, sorry. Um, we always need to look at energy choices in terms of their effects on vulnerable populations. In the case of hydrogen production and hydrogen blending, we see that these choices are likely to put already vulnerable populations further in harm's way. Hydrogen blending means continued reliance on methane, which creates local pollution from fracking for oil and gas. We have the technology we need to decarbonize our homes. Electric appliances are better than burning gas and hydrogen, they are safer, healthier, and better for the climate, more efficient and increasingly less expensive to power. Expanding fossil fuel hydrogen, sorry, expanding fossil hydrogen into homes 
and businesses is not worth the risk to public health, to family economies, or to our environmental justice communities, especially since highly efficient electric alternatives like heat pumps and induction stoves are already available. To make this transition more feasible, the Inflation, Act, the Inflation Reduction Act does provide some tax credits and rebates. Moving off gas and onto electrification will reduce air pollution, help protect the climate, and the financial subsidies directed towards electrification help move it in the right direction of a just transition. Much more needs to be done to increase subsidies for electrification. Due to its scarcity, green hydrogen should be reserved for sectors that aren't easy to electrify. Hydrogen is currently used in the production of fertilizer and steel and will be needed to decarbonize heavy industries like cement making and long distance transport like shipping and aviation. But be careful, the oil and gas industry lobby worked hard to create a new designation for hydrogen called clean hydrogen. And they wrote it into both the American Rescue Plan and the Inflation Reduction Act. Under this designation, both green hydrogen and blue hydrogen are designated as clean, even though blue hydrogen will drive up greenhouse gases and contribute to all the environmental problems associated with carbon capture and sequestration. Don't be fooled by the emperor's claims that his clothes are new. We have to suspiciously scrutinize all proposals uh, claiming proposing to use hydrogen, including and especially hydrogen hubs and hydrogen burning power plants, to say nothing of our homes. As regards to hydrogen, PSRPA would only temporarily support green hydrogen if and when it has been reserved for those sectors and processes that cannot, for now, be hired by electricity for heating and cooling buildings and for cooking our meals, going electric is the way to go. The more we build out our renewable energy sources, the greener our buildings and our lives will become. There is a green path for the future of energy. It requires that we slash our use of fossil fuels, increase our use of truly clean, healthy, renewable forms of energy and make the societal investments that will make it feasible for us to shift our lifestyles like greatly increasing mass transit and active transportation options so we don't have to rely on cars. So the key takeaways revisited, there's a 99% chance that the use of hydrogen for energy is not actually green. Blue and gray hydrogen increase greenhouse gases, extend the use of fossil fuels and hydrogen blending perpetuates reliance on methane and increases risks of accidents and fires and maintains gas stove, indoor air pollution and maintains or expands health inequities. As far as green hydrogen, it's not all it's cracked up to be in the first place. And as far as energy production, we should use it sparingly only until better energy sources are available. The truth is alternatives exist. We need to go electric. Electric appliances are healthier, safer, and more efficient. Okay. Hi. Okay, it looks like we have um, some comments in the chat and we have a question in the Q&A. Um, if you have specific questions, uh, maybe you want to move them over to the Q&A just because it's easier. I'm going to look through the chat quickly if I can. Okay, um, let's go over to the first question. If you if you put a question in the chat, if you could be so kind as to copy and paste it and stick it into the Q&A, that'll make it a little bit more organized. So I don't have to go back and forth um, in case people are just, you know, otherwise not questions, but like otherwise commenting. 
Okay, um, Sydney, Sydney asks, um, an additional drawback of H2 pipelines. H2, the smallest molecule in the universe, is therefore exceedingly difficult to contain. So any pipeline would inevitably leak some portion of its contents, and H2 is itself a greenhouse gas. Um, Okay, so reading that, um, I'm not picking up on an actual question. Sydney, it looks like you're writing a comment, um, a good one at that, um, but I'm gonna mark that answered. Um, okay, we have an anonymous attendee asking, okay, good, and Ginny, good, there's some questions popping in. Um, how are they even possibly justifying hydrogen blending? What are the benefits they are claiming? Um, I mean, because they are labeling blue hydrogen as a, a green solution, um, they are, I mean, it's not true. It's, it's, not, it's not a clean or green solution at all, but because they've given it that label, it blending it then becomes some, in their minds, um, part of the green solution. Um, to be totally honest with you, it's it's just a false solution. It's a false labeling and a false solution. Um, but really, honestly, I think most people, um, when they hear the word hydrogen, they don't think of dangers. So I think that's one of the ways to do this, um, that they get away with this. Another question. Hi, Ginny. Thanks. How are they even claiming that hydrogen blending makes sense? There appears to be no pros and many cons. Um, yeah, so the same thing. I think I think the same exact thing. I think that there are many cons and the only way they're getting away with it is because they've labeled blue hydrogen as a, a green solution, a clean solution, um, a safe solution. Um, they're, they're acting as if blue hydrogen and green hydrogen um, in the Inflation Reduction Act um, it, it, they're acting as if they're the same thing or they're equivalent to one another, that the green and the blue are equivalent to one another. And those labels are absolutely not equivalent. Um, great guys, keep the questions coming. Um, even with green hydrogen, doesn't it still detract from clean energy that could be put to other uses and hence doesn't really help? I agree. I, it's used in these like really heavy um, industries that are really hard to electrify. Um, and in those cases, I, I think that if anywhere that has to be the only one and, and that would still only be a temporary solution until those industries are able to um, get their electricity more efficiently. And I think the focus, I think you're right, this question is uh, talking to Don Ferber. Um, the question that you posed, um, I think that green hydrogen is uh, it's kind of like a unicorn, like it doesn't really um, produce that much energy and it's, you know, it's, it's really difficult to, to get that much renewable energy to produce um, the, the small bit of effect that it has is not really worth it. And there are other things that we should be focused on, especially when we're talking about giving subsidies. The subsidies should be heavily focused elsewhere and hydrogen should be pushed to the side, kind of forgotten about. And if anything is used, it would be green hydrogen sparingly and only temporarily until we come up with better solution for industries. And I hope I have answered that adequately. I agree with you for sure. Um, Susan says, it's not clear to me why hydrogen is being touted as an energy source instead of methane when they are both derived from the same fracking process. That's exactly what I was um, trying to explain. I hope I made it clear in the presentation that it's basically like 99% of the time when they're talking about hydrogen, they're talking about hydrogen that relies on fossil fuels, which is what makes it such a false solution. Um, you know, I think when people hear hydrogen, they don't automatically think about greenhouse gases. And when they hear hydrogen, we, you know, it's in water, it's in hydrogen peroxide. These are things that we, rely on and use all the time. So it doesn't sound like something scary to people. Um, what they're not thinking about is that it's um, often derived from the methane and that um, methane is used to fuel the, the whole process. Um, or coal, um, both. So I agree, the two, they're bound together and um, the general public is not aware of it. 
Um, so I think that's something that you know we have to educate ourselves about and um, educate even policymakers about because I think that they don't always get the, the right answers. Um, I'm just going through with this. Um, these situations are always difficult for me because I can't see your faces um, as I'm doing this. Um, let me come back to the chat. Uh, come back to the Q and A. Um, Emily, your question: um, How many homes or facilities have? Like, I'm sorry, I can't read a block up in the last few years, adding uh, hydrogen scary. Um, I agree that it's scary and I, I don't have, uh, I can't quantify um, how many homes or facilities, um, but that's like a, a new trending thing that they're talking about doing and it's that like 20, 80, 20%, 80% mix of hydrogen blending. I think that's what the question is about. Okay, uh, next question, PK. Um, do they also plan on replacing all the methane piping, for example, in Philly, because the infrastructure is crumbling and already leaking in so many places? Um, I highly doubt that that would be part of the plan, um, although obviously the danger is there. Um, adding hydrogen would be reckless. So the question is, um, is that, a part of their plan as they plan to add 20% of hydrogen and any talk of that and who would pay for that. Um, as far as I know, I think that the, the industry pushing this and the politicians that are pushing this are actually doing the opposite and saying that we already have the existing pipelines um, and therefore to them, this makes sense um, as a means of supposedly somehow saying that this is a, a reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, and would not involve a whole brand new infrastructure. Um, so you're right, I think the dangers are there and I think it's wildly unsafe, um, reckless as you put it. Um, and I don't think that anyone, that they're not planning on having anyone pay for it. I think that that's part of how they're, they're selling it. And we have to be careful. You know, They sold a lot of people on the idea that fracking, um, and for many years, even after fracking went into operation that um, fracking is a, a bridge fuel. I remember when I started in this work, um, you know, about seven years ago, I was constantly talking to people and they were saying, but it's a bridge fuel. Um, so the way they sell it is, is the way people remember it. And they don't usually look too much further into it than the, the first salesman that comes along and tells them what it is. I mean, unless they're impacted personally by it, um, people tend to remember what they heard about it. And then these things get, you know, pushed into existence based on the, on the pitch line that the the industry sells to the politicians that the politicians, you know, buy hook, line, and sinker and present to the constituents. Um, so I hope I've answered that adequately. Um, looks like we've got um, another one by PK and Susan. Um, I think that's the same one. Okay, another one by Cindy. Um, I'm sorry, so now go back and check the, Sydney said that he put several comments in the chat together with others, but it won't allow him to copy them into the Q&A. Susan, it says, um, what avenues are available to prevent these hydrogen adoption practices? Is hydrogen blending already in use somewhere? Um, I do believe that they are um, testing and, and practicing with hydrogen blending. I can't um, list where that is taking place. Um, they're definitely, they're definitely practicing it somewhere. Um, I, I'm, I will try to get back to you if I can get your contact information. Um, just give me a second. I want to make sure I write down your name and uh, if you can put your contact information into the chat, we'll save the chat and Susan, I will try to answer that question because it's a good one that I don't have the answer to. Okay, thanks. So I'll, I'll have to answer that uh, later for you. 
And Sydney, you said your stuff is in the chat, so I'm gonna, oh, thank you, Susan, okay. Um, Okay, I am going to move uh, over to the chat for a minute and see if I can pick up on any of the questions there. And then come back to the Q&A if there's more here. Okay, the chat moves quickly. Okay, so Wes is here from Los Angeles, California, where my region, ga regional gas provider, SoCal Gas, uh, Semper Energy is trying to build a hydrogen um, color to be determined mega hub at the port of LA and Long Beach. Um, I am sorry to hear that. My brother is also in Los Angeles with his young family and um, these hydrogen hubs are popping up all over the place. Um, so I'm sorry to hear that, Wes. Um, that, that's definitely not what we need. Okay, this is it's a little hard to follow the chat. I'm just kind of scanning it for questions because I, I, I can't keep up with the whole conversation. Um, Emily, if you're still on, I don't know if there's a couple questions that you have found. Um, sure, uh, Pat Libby, I, I will send, uh, if I can find out that answer, I can send it to everybody that's registered. Um, and any of the other questions when we go through the chat, um, there's a couple more messages. So if you have questions, just put them in the chat since we're, we're looking here. Um, yes, Wes Sydney, is wired. I'm sorry, can you just um, detail the question again if you have a specific one? Yeah, Wes says, why are we using fire like cave people? I think that's kind of funny. Induction stoves are great, expensive, but great induction plates are a little cheaper. Um, and as PK says in the chat, yeah, there was a power surge and it blew out. Um, lots of electronics. Things can go wrong. It's true. It is nice cooking on them because they cook so evenly and it heats up so quickly. Um, induction stoves are pretty great. <clears throat> and heat pumps are awesome too. I see Wes mentioned those. They seem to be pretty amazing. Okay. Um, Sydney, I can't quite, um, because I haven't been following the chat from the beginning while I was presenting, I can't quite figure out um, exactly what your question is. Um, if you have a specific question, if you could write that question and put it in the chat, I'll do my best to answer it. Otherwise, um, we can always email about it. Um, okay. All right, I'm gonna minimize that, see if there's anything else in the Q&A, anything additional in the Q&A. Um, I think we went through all the questions that are in here. If anybody else has a question in the q and I'll be happy to answer it. <clears throat> And if not, it looks like we are at uh, 6.45 and we can um, wrap up a few minutes early if everybody's okay. Um, um, PK, I agree with your comment that PK needs to upgrade their grid, um, especially given what just happened to, um, to your community. Um, yeah, they have a lot of infrastructure. We have a lot of infrastructure in this whole country to work on. Um, it's amazing. When I was in the nuclear nonproliferation world, I was 
really trying to draw some, um, you know, attention to the amount of money that we spend on nuclear weapons, which is absolutely outrageous. How much we pour into um, weapons that we don't ever use and should never use. Um, you know, if we want to, to keep the planet habitable, we should really just never use them. Um, so pouring billions and billions of dollars into them is just an utter waste of money. Um, so I was, when I was in that field, I was making this comparison of, of how much we spend on that and how much infrastructure is needed here. And I feel like um, when we're looking at our energy system, this is like another reason to look at that infrastructure and pull money away from utterly useless things, um, whether that's subsidizing the fossil fuel industry or um, you know, supporting the um, nuclear weapons industry, um, taking that money and pouring it into infrastructure that will keep us safe and healthy would be the way to go. Um, yeah. Um, so, okay. Um, all right, I'm looking at this and it doesn't seem like there's any more questions in the comment section. People are commenting to each other. Um, bon appetit, Wes. Um, enjoy the, the West Coast, sometimes known as the best coast. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, look, focusing on distributed local energy. Um, that's a good idea. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, our next mm -hmm. webinar, I believe, will be in the fall in September on the 14th um, regarding on Beyond Plastics. Um, and we will share the recording of this webinar within the week and all the questions as well. Thank you. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night.